This is part two of the presentation on seizures and autism, and we are just about to look at several videos that illustrate different causes of atypical movement, including seizure, stereotopy, tic, other movement disorders, and behavioral. So what you saw in this video was a child having a complex partial seizure. There was an interruption of his ongoing behavior. He had been running around and suddenly stopped. He became less aware, less responsive, but still conscious. He had some abnormal chewing movements of his mouth, and then at the very end of the seizure, he rubbed his nose. Here is an example of a child having tics. So this next video is not of seizure. It is of a different type of movement called tics. And this next example is of a child having stereotopy. So you can see that the child is excited, and that excitement leads to the movements of his hands. Now, for the case that we've been discussing with the 10-year-old boy, there were several important clues about the events he was having that led me to think they were very likely to be seizures. One was the presence of behavioral arrest, where he stopped doing whatever he had been doing. Uh, his head always moved to the same side. There was an alteration of awareness. He uh, rubbed his nose at the end of the event. And after the seizure, in the post-ictal phase, he was both confused and drowsy. His events were not at all related to emotional state. They seemed to come out of the blue. They could not be interrupted by calling to him or shaking his arm. And several other features that are important clues that invent seizure, but were not present in this case, are um, sleep-related events. So events that occur uh, on falling asleep, during sleep, or on waking up from sleep, on chewing movements, and picking movements of the hands. Those are uh, movements that are very often associated with specific types of seizures. So if you look at back at this diagram, we saw an example of, uh, in the very, very first video, we saw an example of a boy having a complex partial seizure. And that uh, turned out to be the diagnosis for the 10-year-old boy that I've been telling you about as well. But you can see that there may be types of seizures in which you have only movements with no alteration of awareness, or you have only some sensory uh, disturbance that may be visual, auditory, a uh, smell or a taste, or the sensation of vertigo. Uh, you might have symptoms like um, uh, disturbance of language, um, memory disturbance, illusions or hallucinations. Um, and then down here in generalized seizures are the type that most of us are more familiar with uh, here, the generalized convulsive seizures in which there are jerking movements of the body. And this is an example of a generalized convulsive seizure. And this is an example of a generalized seizure as well, but a type called absence seizure.
And there's another seizure where the child looks off and blinks. And the child may not be aware that he or she is having those events. Here's another example. And those blinking movements of the eyes represent seizure. And here's another example. And this is a seizure type called myoclonic seizure. So returning to the case of a 10-year-old boy, he had an EEG that showed occasional sharp waves in the right temporal lobe. And those sharp waves, waves indicate an area of cortical irritability. The cortex is the outer layer of the brain and is the part of the brain that uh, very often gives rise to seizures. And based on the EEG finding, it seemed very likely that that was the area of the brain that was the point of origin of the seizures. And this boy uh, went on to have a brain MRI that showed a 4 centimeter focal cortical dysplasia in the right temporal lobe, which is a part of the brain very important for auditory processing, language comprehension, storing new memories, and emotion processing. And you can see the right temporal lobe here highlighted in red. And on a brain MRI, a focal cortical dysplasia very often has the appearance of being more white in color uh, compared to the rest of the brain tissue. Now, uh, there are several tests to consider in the evaluation of seizure. An EEG will be the first one. And when thinking about whether or not a child needs an EEG, uh, there are several things to consider. One is that the EEG is helpful in answering, is the episode a seizure or other type of event? If a seizure, what type of seizure? And this is important as it informs treatment. Are there subclinical seizures? Meaning, are there seizures occurring that are detectable only by the EEG and there's no outward manifestation that can be observed? What is the risk of seizure recurrence? Is there a focal brain abnormality? And are there areas of abnormal electrical activity that may be impacting cognition behavior and or development? Another test to consider is a brain MRI. And brain imaging is useful um, if the seizure type, EEG findings, or neurological exam suggest a focal lesion. But the utility is unclear. So brain MRI has a low likelihood of influencing treatment or management decisions. Genetic and metabolic testing may also be helpful. And this would be done um, to look for syndromic causes of autism and epilepsy, meaning genetic or metabolic disorders that may manifest as the symptoms of autism and epilepsy. Uh, seizures secondary to a metabolic disorder may improve with treatment of the underlying disorder. And abnormal findings on chromosomal microarray, which is a specific type of genetic test, are more likely in autism with epilepsy and with intellectual disability. So if a child has autism and then goes on to develop epilepsy, the likelihood of, of having a finding on a chromosomal microarray that helps to explain the child's condition uh, is more likely. Is treatment needed for seizures and what type of treatment? The decision of whether or not to treat should always be based on careful consideration of all possible risks and benefits. There are risks of not treating seizure, one of which is focal injury to brain tissue, and another is status epilepticus, which is a prolonged seizure, uh, which uh, and prolonged seizures may lead to injury of brain tissue, and prolonged seizures may also be difficult to stop. There are risks of treating, and those are primarily the side effects of treatment. Uh, other factors to consider are the seizure type, frequency, and severity, the impact of seizures on the quality of life, and the potential of certain types of treatments to not only improve seizures, but possibly improve the symptoms of autism as well. This is a review paper that was published in 2013 
in which the researchers reviewed both traditional and novel treatments for seizures in those with autism. And the first major category of treatment options are anticonvulsant medications. And there are several considerations when selecting a medication. What is the seizure type? What is the mechanism of action of a particular medication? What are the potential side effects, both positive and negative? And could pharmacogenomic testing be helpful to guide selection and dosing of, of a medication? Pharmacogenomic testing is a new type of testing that's available that looks at different genetic variants that help to uh, give us information about how an individual will metabolize different medications and whether they might need different dosing of medications or whether they might be more prone to side effects. So from that review article that I just mentioned, um, there are several uh, tables that provide guidelines in selecting a first-line anti-epileptic drug for the treatment of seizure in a child with autism. And there are certain symptoms, for example, gastrointestinal, mitochondrial, gross, uh, weight, or behavioral, that might influence what medications to avoid and possible alternatives. There are also other um, traditional treatments. Uh, MAD here refers to the modified Atkins diet. VNS refers to a vagus nerve stimulator, which is an implantable device that is effective for the control of seizures. Um, there are different surgical procedures that can be helpful in, in epilepsy treatment. IVIG is intravenous immunoglobulin, um, steroids, neurofeedback. These are all different uh, therapies that have been used and studied in the treatment of seizure. And um, unfortunately, the research evidence for the use of these uh, treatments for seizure in those with autism is not very good. So not many studies have been done. The studies that have been done have been a very small sample size. So the level of um, evidence for these as being effective treatment options for, for epilepsy and autism is quite low. And you can see um, a grade of A is the highest level of evidence, and then B, C, and D are um, decreasing levels of evidence. There are also what these researchers have classified as novel treatments for epilepsy, and they include a variety of different um, dietary supplements, dietary approaches, and then a technique called slow repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And again, unfortunately, the research evidence in favor uh, of these or um, for the efficacy of these in the treatment of seizures in those with autism is very low. Um, and N refers to uh, essentially no research studies having been done looking at um, the efficacy of these for those with autism and epilepsy. Well, what you can see is that some of these novel treatments do have clear uh, research evidence showing their efficacy for the treatment of seizures in populations of, of, of uh, other patients. So, for example, magnesium is first-line treatment for uh, certain seizure types in pregnant women. And... Um, you'll see that the evidence for these alternative therapies in other populations is also um, pretty poor at this time. But uh, further research needs to be done. I'll just say another word about nutritional approaches to seizure management. And there are currently three different dietary therapies known to be effective for seizure control. And they are the ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, and the low glycemic index diet. And in my view, an approach to nutrition to optimize neurologic function begins with um, several components of the medical history and exam, potentially food sensitivity testing, a variety of other tests, a food journal, and also identifying potential obstacles to change. As a lot of the nutritional um, difficulties in children with autism have to do with behavioral, uh, behavioral issues. 